Well, I can't tell you how pleased I am uh, to be joined by Eric Schmidt for this discussion. Could I invite you to take your seats and um, we'll get underway. As you know, of course, Eric Schmidt is executive chairman of Alphabet and is in a really unique position to help us think through some of the challenges and issues we're discussing today as the head of one of the world's largest technology companies. And as executive chairman of Alphabet, he's responsible for the external matters of all of the holding company's businesses, advising the CEO and leadership on business and policy issues, he joined Google in 2001 and helped grow that company from really nearly a startup phase to really a global leader in technology. He served as CEO from 2001 to 2011, uh, overseeing the company's technical and business strategy, along with the founders, Sergey Brin and Larry Page. And under his leadership and during these years, Google has obviously dramatically scaled its infrastructure, diversified its product offerings, while remaining a very strong culture of innovation, which is also a subject of a recent book uh, that uh, you have written. And I'm very uh, pleased that we had a chance to discuss um, a couple of years, uh, just helped, about you, a year you ago. You helped me sell the book, so thank uh, you. Uh, uh, it needed very little help. So thanks so much for being with us. And you know, this morning we've just finished two framing conversations looking at the cross trends of globalization, driving economic integration and interconnection, and at the same time tensions and frictions that are uh, arising in the system. So I'd like to invite you to start us off uh, with just your own sense of framing on how important is this free flow of data across boundaries in enabling the uh, technological innovation that we think of as important, things like Internet of Things or the app economy or outsourcing of services or cloud computing or the potential of big data um, and many other things you would speak to and think about. Is that cross-border flow crucial to this innovation in these areas? Well, thank you and it's great to be back and uh I really like the fact that you put this together uh, on subjects that I care a great deal about, and I think we all do. Um, when I think about the internet, I start with uh, the story of naivete, right? That the internet, and I was sort of present near the beginning, was really about people who had a different model of how society was going to work, uh, and sort of built it without much supervision from anyone. Um, and so a small team of people basically interconnected this thing starting roughly in the 70s. It was commercialized in 1991 um, by various changes in the government. And, but the goal was to have a true sphere of communication of all people. And people were sufficiently naive, of which I was the chief naive person, that there was no notion of security. Um, one of my projects when I was a programmer was I wrote a mail system that allowed you to impersonate anyone else, trivially. Made perfect sense. Um, the internet at the time, obviously. The internet was designed without any core security protocols, any core definition of identity. So if I look back over 45 years of this, the fact that the internet has become so fundamental to everything is one of the greatest and most pleasant surprises of, of anyone's life and certainly of mine. But also, we're now dealing with some of those sort of core, core errors. So let me, stay, let me state right up front that almost all of the interesting progress going on in the world is going on because of the internet or in spite of the internet. It is now fundamental. I used to give these speeches where I would say, hey, you know, you can turn this thing off, right? Sort of go back to being a normal person. And I think the reality is that if you look at your students here, you look at the sort of next generation of users, our customers, if you will, collectively, it's too fundamental to their lives mm -hmm. in every aspect. Mm -hmm. And, you know, is the cross-border nature of that fundamental or is it for big economies enough to have, uh, you know, uh, say a U.S. internet, or China internet, Europe internet? Well, there's a, and Jared Cohen was here, um, I think yesterday or the day before, and he and I wrote a book together on this. And at the time, we were very concerned about 
the Balkanization of the internet, uh, someone was in the audience from the Balkans and they found that offensive. So <laughs> let's just use the word fragmentation instead of Balkanization, which is what I really mean. And uh, the question is, if you're a little itty bitty country, can you have your own internet? And the answer is almost certainly not. Because little countries are by nature trading companies, they are codependent on the others. Can a very large company, country, such as China, actually cut itself off? Again, 10 years ago, I would have said no. Today, I think that there's evidence that they can do that. Or at least they can have the internet on their terms, as opposed to our terms. So for the last, uh, since, since not being CEO anymore, I've wandered around preaching my religion, which is open expression, interconnectivity, things you all care a great deal about. And a typical example is you'll go to an autocrat who runs the country, and you'll say the internet is really, really good for your country because the autocrat's primary objective is economic growth and perhaps the spoils of that, uh, and certainly more power. So that message makes sense to typically him. Uh, then you go to the opposition leader who's trying to build a democracy, and you explain that the internet is just as important to he or she because of the empowerment of political speech, opposition, information, and so forth. But what you conclude over and all is that as Americans, most, most fo folks here are either American or obviously live here, uh, we are critically dependent upon global integration. We are safer, literally safer, because two billion people were lifted out of poverty. So if you think of it in the context of war, right, and humans are very, very good at killing each other uh, at the nation state level, look at our history over 2,000 years, right, you can make an argument that the internet is a core constructor of at least peace. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, you know, we had a bit of a discussion earlier about whether we should think of this as fragmentation or segmentation and that, in fact, uh, you know, there could be safety and soundness that follows from certain yeah. kinds. No. Here's the way this works is, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to be so rude. I apologize. No, it, it was very clear. <laughs> okay, so, so here's the problem. And this is what we do at Google every day, is that there are actually differences between countries on things that have been litigated for a thousand years. For example, copyright laws differ. The definitions of free speech, let's use Nazi speech, Nazi speech is horrific, is illegal in Germany, horrific and legal in America, right? That's not an endorsement of it, guys. It's just true, right? You have to have an internet that can accommodate the differences in laws. In my exhaustive survey of this with our lawyers, I can tell you there's one thing that all of humanity agrees is evil, and that's child pornography, thank goodness. And indeed, the internet is quite good about child pornography in the sense that there are algorithms that have been used to have when this evil stuff shows up, we can actually um, essentially uh, provide a hash of it, algorithmically determine that it is in fact uh, the, the bad content and suppress it, right? So if we can, o if that's the only thing we really agree on as a global society, and I'm talking about legally now, I'm not talking about morally, then we need to work on other agreements of what's appropriate. But for the same reason that we don't agree on that, I don't want other countries' rules affecting the US laws. I want the US to be in charge of those laws, and the inverse is true. So you have to build systems that are flexible with respect to the local laws. Mm -hmm. um, another example, we learned this the hard way. In Thailand, and I didn't know this at the time, there's a very, very severe law with respect to criticism of the king. And, um, and again, we, we, we're operating well in Thailand at the moment, but this was now a decade ago. Um, someone posted a, uh, a, a, a video on YouTube that was critical of the king, which is a, a clear crime and it, it's not okay. It's clearly okay in other countries. And so YouTube was shut down for a year, right? So that was a pretty heavy penalty for a single individual Right, who I'm, I don't know who it was, but I was told that this particular person fled the country and so forth. Uh, there, th this story is repeated over and over again in social media that cross national boundaries. Mm -hmm. 
Now, if you're a, a sort of a liberal American internet person, you say, well, isn't it great that all these people are talking to each other? There's plenty of organizations and countries that don't want this content in their country. So you have to come up with some sort of reasonably flexible model which will allow you to operate globally. And that's what all the internet companies are struggling with. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one... And, I'm sorry, I, I, since I sort of mo groaned, what I worry about is the slippery slope of censorship. Mm -hmm. So we are very strongly opposed as our, at a company level against censorship. So what happens is somebody says, this, this is clearly bad and we should censor it. Okay. And then they use that to argue for another level of censorship and then another level of censorship. And soon you have a censored internet. Um, we effectively have that in Turkey, by the way, today through a series of builds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I was thinking as you were speaking of uh, perhaps French privacy thinking, uh, thinking that it should have a global reach. How do you think about that problem? Well, let's talk about the specific, the specific issue. So there is a bill in France, um, which, I'm which has been described to me as saying that the right to be forgotten, which is a law in Europe, or if, uh, technically it's a, a found law from the European Court of Justice, which we opposed. And uh, that particular law allows people to get, if they're not a public figure and it's not material to, to the public, standard which is not defined, uh, that information can be um, withdrawn from the internet, although still published on the sites that it's at. We argued against this, I testified against it, and so forth. Nevertheless, that is the law in Europe. The question is, should that law now apply to the US? What would the Americans say? It's pretty obvious. Mm -hmm. In the same sense, I don't think the French would particularly want our, some of the aspects of our law in their system. So that's where the negotiation is. And um, I understand, per, on a personal basis, I understand why countries feel this way. They want to do this. But it's not how the internet works. So our answer in the case of France is that there's a French country domain which we are absolutely 100% compliant with, but the, the technical term here is global removal. If we establish a principle of global removal that the French would have, the French are certainly, it's certainly a strong democracy, they have a, an important election on Sunday, they're certainly great people, they certainly have a long tradition on these things, but should they make the decision for the global content? Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not sure that the US and the Russians and the Chinese and the Indians would all agree to the same terms. Mm -hmm. Of course, this is not the first area where this has revealed itself. Its, its, its jurisdiction is a fundamental problem in a globalized world. Are there technology solutions that you are designing, developing, that you think help with this problem? So the, the, there are some issues that, that are not resolved in an obvious way. So if you want a global standard of content, is the rule for your global standard the least common denominator, that is the most censored, or the most liberal for the global standard, right? I'm asking that rhetorically. Uh, I would prefer, and I think our company would prefer, and I suspect you all would prefer the lowest possible level of censorship. Right? But there are other people and other countries and other religions that would strongly disagree with us, right? So how do we adjudicate that? And they feel, and trying to channel their, their anger, that this is American hegemony. In other words, we built it, and now we're enforcing our values on them. And this is what they say to me. And so then it becomes an important negotiation where we say, well, look, we really believe in the empowerment of individuals and the empowerment of this information. And we think you're better off if you embrace this to some degree. Try telling that to an autocrat whose power derives precisely from the omission of fact. Right? So again, these, these are trends which have nothing to do with the internet. They have to do with societies organized. Mm -hmm. But I would hope that all of us would agree that open political speech and uh, at least partial, if not full, democracies are a better way to run countries. Mm -hmm. you, you know, we've seen in the post-war period some institutions designed to deal with the economic flows. Uh, the WTO is one. I served for some years on that uh, appellate body. And digital trade was really never part of the regime, although uh, has crept in through certain non-discrimination and services uh, protocols. So one might think about the problem that you're raising uh, 
differences in national preferences as requiring some kind of effort at an international level to create um, rules or uh, bilaterally or regionally. Uh, you, you know, there's a debate about multi-stakeholder, how to incorporate that, et cetera. What are your thoughts on if you're going to build some pillars, should we be trying to do that or should we just, is, is it going to create more harm than good? Well, I think that the globe is much better off because of the, the uh, multilateral institutions that were created largely after the Second World War. And if you look at, uh, you know, all the systems of global trade, global commerce, global banking, they all have in their roots a set of our predecessors, if you will, who saw that the sum of us was better than the individuals, right? It's quite obvious. And partly that happened because America was 85% of the global GDP at the time. It's right after the war. And that we could essentially dictate American terms. Now, that's not what they said and so forth, but we sort of get a free pass here because 60 or 70 years ago, we had a greater influence than our population would have indicated. So it seems to me that now that we have, we America invented the internet, but the entire world depends on it, what percentage control should we have? Most people agree that the ICANN structure has been a good one, right? That it has allowed a multi-stakeholder process. Uh, and again, there's complicated issues of where it's managed and who controls it. But the fact of the matter is that there's value there. My concern is that I don't see these issues are coming so fast and the consensus building in peacetime is so long, which oh, I'd rather have peacetime than wartime, obviously, um, that I don't know that we're gonna, it's gonna happen fast enough. My, my current favorite example has to do with um, the militarization of cyberspace. There are many, many computer scientists and technical people, we have computer science in the room, who feel that this newest phenomena where governments are using the internet to attack other either individuals, companies, or nation states is really a, a really bad thing for all sorts of reasons, which we can go into. And there are many people who think that, well, isn't, wouldn't this be a perfect example of a treaty? Okay, well, I don't need to tell you all how long it takes to do treaty negotiations and so forth. And we can have a separate debate as to the likelihood of that treaty. But this stuff is this important then maybe we should start thinking about what are the treaties that would allow for multi-stakeholder collaboration, individual countries, freedom, but full integration of the global sphere, which we are critically dependent on as a society. Right? So I, I, again, just to, just to make sure I say it clearly, the core thing about technological process, progress is time. And the core aspect of time is communication. We now have almost all of the interesting developments in science, which I care a lot about, occurring across national borders uh, in nanoseconds because of fiber optics, right? So if you go to the history of drug development, you'd have so-and-so would develop it and then they'd wait six months for both the shipments and the letters to arrive from, the, from you know, uh, New York to Paris or what have you, and then they would make more progress and then they would ship it back and so forth. That compression of time which is core to economic growth, core to efficiency, core to human health, core to prosperity, core to IQ, intelligence, education, you name it, right? That's one of the greatest accomplishments of the internet. And I do not want to see anything that slows that down, right? Because the challenges of growth, the issues that we're gonna face over the next 100 years will be strongly enabled by that. Imagine if you didn't have that. Imagine if communications with Europe required a boat, right? Just think about it. So, you know, one of the things I think we're going to puzzle over is what are the steps that can be taken to increase trust, uh, both technologically and otherwise. I mean, just this week, um, uh, we had uh, some attacks going on, uh, Google Docs, and Google could bring it down almost immediately. I would think... Well, we did. I, I, that's what I, I said. I think we did it in a few minutes. It, and so... And it could generate a huge press cycle. That in, inspires some trust. If you have that problem and you can correct it. Very few companies can do that. Yeah, by the way, the headlines didn't say, Google fixed this in 30 seconds. Uh -huh. The headlines say, big bug affecting everyone in the internet. <laughs> right. By the way, the, the actual, so we're clear, the actual story is someone figured out a way to create a false secondary page, which we then figured out that they had done this and we blocked it, okay? Mm -hmm. 
but because of virality, it spread very quickly. So the correct story, not to tell the press what to write, uh, was this was discovered, it was fixed just like that. Hey, that's how it's supposed to work. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was trying to give you an opening to talk about trust, and that's one example. What others would you speak to about how we inspire more trust? Well, the first question I always ask about trust is, are the people trying to improve trust or increase distrust, right? So we have lots of evidence, uh, for example, in the election that Russia was involved in confusion, shall we say, in the US elections. And there's some evidence that that's now going on in Europe. Mm -hmm. So not all the players have the same collegial goals that members of this audience do. And so what do you do in the presence of people who are trying to destabilize as well as stabilize? I think to me that's the core question. Uh, and one way to understand that is that it's possible on the internet to create large amounts of misinformation for your own purposes that are not necessarily for the betterment of society. Um, and it's relatively easy now, right, to create information sources. Typical example is you'll get somebody who will utter a falsehood, and which is a known falsehood, and you get another group that will try to magnify that by various forms of uh, identity theft and making it look like this is huge, some huge phenomenon. So the analogy in television is you've got two protesters, right? And I'll give you a simpler example. There was a, in 1989, there was a, a big earthquake in California, and um, there was a fire in the marina. And the fire was very severe, and it consisted of three buildings. So the cameras were all placed on that fire, and that became the narrative of California was on fire. I remember this because I was in California, and California was not on fire, but these three buildings were. So we've got to be careful as a society around this pinpointing of information and then its expansion. In, in, I'm not criticizing the coverage of the earthquake in 1989. I'm just using it as an example. It was a fine outcome, um, and it's got fixed, and, and San Francisco went on to great success. Um, I, I worry that these techniques in information markets can be used to create falsehoods that deceive either consumers or what have you. Um, in ter this, to me, this is the core issue of trust. Um, there's a secondary issue, which is, the, is the system itself being hacked? And the good news there is that there is technology in the form of very powerful encryption, which is unbreakable at current technologies and likely to be unbreakable for the rest of our lives. The bad news is that these technologies are not uniformly um, applied. So for example, many of the government computers that we're using are very back rev because the government doesn't upgrade its softwares very quickly. That's a huge opportunity for hackers and people to, to, to steal data from the government. Mm -hmm. um, and it needs to be fixed, and my view is that's a national crisis. And, and other people agree on this, and people are working on this. Um, how do you increase the cyber hygiene? I mean, a lot of, uh, we had the OPM hack uh, is one example that you're referring to, but you know, the tremendous vulnerabilities that, that could be addressed if there was an upgrade of cyber hygiene generally. Do you think that well, is let me start with Well, let me start with this group and say that, uh, I'll give you the numbers. Roughly 90% of the attacks are phishing. Phishing is where a page is presented to you that looks like a legitimate login page, and it's not. So be very careful. This is, this is what happened to John Podesta. There's a long, long list of, of victims in this space. About 10% are malware, and malware is where the piece of software gets inserted to your computer and it sort of takes over the computer in some complicated way. Both of these are best addressed by keeping the software of your computer platform up to date, and I mean the latest version, by using a browser that happens to be the most popular and the most free, which is Chrome, which does various, inform various checking, and then also two-factor authentication. That is a second factor, so not just your password. If you have, and most people, by the way, think that they have all three, and almost none of you have all three. So if I could do one thing with this audience is that sometime today, add two-factor, make sure you're running Chrome, which is free. Uh, and then if you want to have extra uh, protection, use Gmail for all of your secrets. And the reason is that Gmail is encrypted at rest as well as in transit. Right. Now, people say, really? And I said, yeah. And in fact, many of the systems, and probably here in the university, 
they're not fully updated, they're not fully encrypted. That will take care of most of the issues. Mm -hmm. right? So that's a, a thing that you can do. Mm -hmm. um, with respect to the overall systems hijack, like the OPM hack, which I looked at pretty carefully, the core issue is that in the case of OPM and others, the government's systems were designed in the 80s and 90s, and they're highly porous. Right? Yeah. And so it's reasonable to expect that this will continue until the government learns how to build proper, integrated, modern software. Um, and I know, I know the current administration is aware of this. I know they have teams working on this. The Obama administration was working on it. I was part of that. Uh, and it needs to get addressed. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Let me shift topics and ask you to share some thinking about the role of platforms. As I think you know we think about them now as matters of competition policy. We also see them as offering you know benefits for security purposes. You can run your systems, uh, etc. How should we think about the up and downsides of platforms in a world of of several enormous and important ones? Well, we're in a situation, uh, for most of my career, we had um, one or two platforms that defined everything. So when I started, it was the IBM mainframe, and then for a long time, it was the IBM PC, and in particular, Microsoft. And when the internet arrived, the internet sort of broke a lot of that up and gave people sort of hyper-competitive choices. So today, you have a number of platforms which are hyper-competitive against each other. And that hyper-competition is why your prices are so low for supercomputers. So my best example here is the um, iPhone versus Android. Um, the claimed market shares of the two, Android, the market says, is around 85%. iPhone is something north of 10%. That competition, right, at price and scale and so forth, these are billions of phones across the two platforms, um, is the most brutal competition that I've ever seen. Right, just, just in terms of economics and movement and pressure and so forth and so on. You benefit from that competition from that. So that's a good example where the platform structure ended up with real material consumer benefits globally. Mm -hmm. um, so notice that the two operating systems in that are done out of California. And the hardware is done all around the world. So there are people who want more competition, which I certainly agree with. And I would rather have, so using Europe as a specific example, I would rather have many stronger Silicon Valleys in Europe and many stronger uh, platform companies, many f stronger digital companies. I've spent a lot of time trying to develop this in Europe. I can talk about it at, at any length. Um, rather than having the Europeans prohibit their, the entry of the global platforms into Europe. right? And the problem is that there's always a possibility that this will ignite essentially a, a trade war. And a trade war is not beneficial to the Europeans. It hurts them, right? And so we've, I have worked personally a lot on that. Mm -hmm. do, do you see the DSM as, as uh, an effort to create more national champions? Or does it, is it creating distortions that are making it more difficult for interoperability? How do you think about, about that? Well, as a, as a general... As a general comment, the way to play in our industry is to learn what we do really well and run as hard as you can. There's infinite capital now around the world to do these things. And there's pretty much infinite access relative to your current install base at zero if you're a startup. So the hyper-competition, right, think, think about how easy it is to start a company today versus 20 years or 30 years ago. So I go back to my basic message, which is, um, in fact, I should, I'll let me say it more clearly. Because of the technological advances that are going on right now, I am very convinced that there will be five more Uber, Facebook, Google, what have, what have you companies founded during this decade that will rise to those scales why are they not globally distributed? Why don't we have some of those in China and in Europe and so forth? We should. Right? It's up to the founders to found them. It's up to the employees to work hard. But we, we understand the formula. The IQ education capability is there. I know because we hire these people. Right? So it's not a lack of ability. It's, it's just a, a, a motivational problem. 
very fascinating comment. You know, a couple of years ago, I'm going to keep moving to some other topics to get ideas out and then open it up uh, for this very expert audience to ask some questions. But a couple of years ago at, at Davos, I heard you uh, posit that in a choice between man and machine, you chose man. And I remember thinking, what kind of question is that? Of course, there's no other choice. But in fact, we've seen in the last year and a half this tremendous anxiety arising all over the world about both globalization and technological change and blending this into a worry about, uh, about technology and about uh, uh, international commerce and, and, and many other things. I think it's contributed to the uh, you know, data localization, the my borders, you know, uh, you know, create boundaries um, uh, mentality that I think is we're seeing everywhere. So clearly, we have to manage uh, 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 and address this anxiety and manage a transition with different skill sets. So how do you th see that problem? How do you think about that? I'd like to give the sort of a technical or economic answer as distinct from the marketing answer. Mm -hmm. There's clearly a failure of marketing, right? That the people who are being affected by these, in some cases negatively, don't feel, don't perceive some of the benefits, right? So from their perspective, it's net negative. But I think um, if, if we start with, we are infinitely better off on pretty much every measure now than we were before. And we also feel worse, okay? One possibility, which people have speculated about, is that we feel worse because we have more information. And that humans, as we have more information, worry more. Right? Well, I'm not going to stop providing more information. Our, our mission is more information. So I have to solve that problem. I don't know how to solve that problem. But if you look at uh, today's headline, jobless rate in America, the lowest it's been in a decade. Uh, Think about all of those concerns about automation and replacement of jobs 10, 20 years ago. Y2K, remember all that, right? There are more jobs now than ever. Um, we studied this pretty thoroughly. Uh, when the ATM came out, people were very concerned, very properly, I thought, about the jobs of bank tellers. There are more bank tellers now than ever because banks are more efficient. So again, I think we tend to see the negative in a specific dislocation. Uh, and this is real. I'm not, again, I'm not in any way denying the, both the perception and the local, because people operate in a local environment. But in aggregate, the society is better. Mm -hmm. So I go back to the, to being an internationalist is better than being um, a xenophobic. I go back to diversity and inclusion um, is the best way to run your society. It's also the best way to run your company, right? And yes, you have to manage the concerns that people have about diversity and inclusion, but they're wrong and we're right in believing that, that, that we believe that diversity and inclusion produces better shareholder return. It's a fact. It's not a debatable question. You could debate it, but you're wrong if you don't think that's true. Right? I mean, I'm, I'm sure. Right? So, so we, we operate under a set of values which I think reflect the values of globalized society. I suspect Columbia and, and people in this room do as well. Again, maybe we have a marketing problem in communicating that, but I do not want to give those up, right? It is not okay to slide back into xenophobia, prejudice, uh, tyranny. I mean, I could go on a list, right? It's how wars happen. Well, thank you. Um, let me ask you one last question, uh, which is, you know, we, we have this tremendous conversation occurring on our campus and around the world about the potential for artificial intelligence. That uh, comes up also in this man versus machine, and will they, in fact, uh, be affecting the kinds of jobs that were previously not affected by technological change? Could you speak a little bit more about both what you see this potential as being, the exciting potential, um, uh, as well as the challenges? So the history of these debates, they've been going, off, going on since the Luddites. So, um, so roughly 200 years of these debates, maybe longer, are that a new technology comes along and there is material and significant displacement and there are uh, local concerns that are very serious, right? We forget that we talk about America as a uh, melting pot, that as immigrants came to Ellis Island, there were riots in lower Manhattan over the presence of those immigrants, 
right? Thank God we're not doing that today. So these are not new phenomena. So when you, in order to, to say these are really permanent and structural changes that are net negative, which is what some people say, you have to prove that this time it's different, right? In other words, that the demand that is achieved by efficiency, by globalization, by rising living standards, right, that the sum of all of that will not absorb the efficiencies of a smaller and smaller amount of workforce. So to make it a facetious point, you'd have to convince yourself that a declining, declining, declining workforce and an ever-increasing idle force, the sum of that won't generate more demand. Right? That's roughly the argument you have to make. Um, that's never been true. Now, it's always possible that the future will be different. But in order to believe that it's different now, you have to believe that humans are not adaptable that they're not creative, that they don't respond to economic, political, and moral, and religious signals, which obviously we do, and so forth. So I have come to the view that, that the, the argument is, is it at its core wrong. This is my personal view. Uh, but we're debating about the future, so we can have a great debate, and people can disagree. Um, we're not debating over facts. We're de de debating about what we think will happen in the future. So what I think is that the technology that's being built is generally being built in the open and for the benefit of everyone. So let me be more direct and say that the technology in general makes people smarter. In the same sense that Google has made you smarter in the sense of your memory is much better. You can't remember all that's in Google. Nobody can. But now you can sound like you're an expert because you're secretly looking something up on Google and you can say, oh, well, you know, in the war of 1792 and so forth. They go, wow, right? Um, the same principle applies to human cognition, human business, human jobs, human demand, entertainment, and so forth going forward. We are, in, as an industry, we're trying to make people smarter. We will make them somewhat smarter, and that will produce greater jobs and greater economic efficiency, and that's my strong view. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Well, we have a few minutes for questions. Uh, I'd like to invite uh, Hugo to start us off. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm the cyber fellow here at SIPA, and uh, I want to come back to one of the things you said. First thing I'm going to say is uh, I'm from France, so uh, xenophobia is very much uh, on the top of my list of worries these days. Um, but one of the things that you said is okay, the importance of um, diversity and inclusion. And I think one of the challenges here... I'm not sure if it's me or if it's, it's not your, me, but it's your political opponent. <laughs> Am I being hacked right now? Um, so uh, one of the things that I think is uh, is most worrisome is that e both the positive and negative consequences of, of digitalization are not uniformly uh, distributed. Uh, and I think that's a lot of the things that we're talking about is uh, the, the the benefits of automation are perhaps distributed in an unevenly fashion between different. Uh, classes or, or groups of people within society. And, um, and governments uh, usually had that role of redistributing uh, the benefits of, of technological disruptions and also making sure that the, the harms that could come uh, from them are also evenly distributed so that we don't pick on the same category of people all the time. What do you think is the role of technology companies in this regard in making sure that both the benefits of technology and the harms that can come with it are evenly distributed, and I'll add, not only, not only within countries, so even in, in a society like the US, but also globally uh, between the US and, say, countries in Africa or countries in South America. Thank you. So, so we have worked hard, for example, a, a series of answers, real quick. We worked really hard to make sure, uh, to, to make sure that uh, connectivity is present in the developing world. And one of the things that I'm proudest of is that we've played a significant role in getting people who had no access to information at all connected. So we take for granted the arrival of a new smartphone. If you are in a developing world, a single phone is your education, it's your safety, it's your politi politics, it's your entertainment. It's far more important, for example, than a television for the same thing. So I'm very proud of the role we've played there. Um, there are limits to what we can do. Our position is our products are largely, are, are typically free, which is the best way to get inclusion, or near free, that is inexpensive. 
So in industries where you have declining costs and broad reach, I think you have your best chance at sort of at least providing people a, a level platform to start from. There are limits to how much we can do because we're heavily regulated in all these countries. Thank you. I think this gentleman, um, we're, uh, we're, we're trying to encourage uh, faculty, staff, students, guests. And so if press are here, come towards the end of the line if you wouldn't mind. Okay. Uh, just speak up. Just, just yell at the audience. Uh, so, thank you, Mr. Schmidt. My name is Andrea Glorioso. I'm an official of the European Commission, and I work at the delegation of the European Union to the U.S. in Washington, D.C. on the okay. digital economy portfolio. First of all, allow me to say on a personal basis, but here I am sure to speak on behalf of the European Union, to commend you for your remarks about the importance of not sliding back into xenophobia. That's a, an extremely important point that we should all remember. But then I would like to focus on one passage of your remarks, concerning specifically the right to be forgotten or the right to deletion, as we call it in the European Union, which is, by the way, it's not only the court judgment of the European Court of Justice, it is now the law, and it applies not only to search changes, but all data controllers. And specifically, one thing that you said, if I understood correctly, how would Americans react? How would American people react faced with the request to delete information the same way that we would see how it will actually be implemented in Europe? And it seems to me that you are suggesting that Americans will be, by and large, opposed to such an idea. And yet, we see, not only my personal experience speaking with Americans all across this country, but also... I think perhaps you should just talk to the audience without the mic. Uh, so not only my conversation with American people across this country, but we also see surveys, for example, by the TIA, by Ipsos, on behalf of trustee, that actually Americans are very concerned about the use of the personal information online. And at least to a certain extent, uh, if we actually agree with the definition of the right to deletion, they're not necessarily opposed to the idea that there are situations in which you should have a right to delete your own information from the internet, even though it's factually true, but it's not relevant anymore. And you even have laws in this country, for example, on criminal expungement uh, records, uh, where after a certain number of years, yes, you have committed a crime, but it's not relevant anymore, so that can be removed from your public record. Okay, thank you. If we could... I can guess my point, sorry, thank you. I, needed to give the context. Uh, my question is, are you describing, uh, uh, is your statement normative? This is how you would like American people to behave? Or is it descriptive? This is how American people, what American people actually believe. And do you have data? And did you base descriptive statement? I want to be careful not to predict the American legal and political outcomes in this question. So I just observe that, the, and I've been told by many lawyers, that the legal basis and doctrine of free speech would prevent, in America, this is what I've been told, the right to be forgotten principles which exist in, in Europe. Um, our opposition to right to be forgotten was actually slightly different. The way the European Court of Justice did it is it made, rather than a government, it made Google the decider of what was relevant and secure. And that's not a role that Google wants. Right. We don't think that we're the best people to determine in a per country basis what content should be shown or not shown. We would like another, a, a more elected body, if you will, as opposed to a company to make that decision. Uh, nevertheless, it is the law and we fully implemented it. Thank you. had to do with productivity in the digital world, and you observe that it doesn't seem right, that there's something wrong in the calculation. A lot of economists I've spoken with agree with you, and there's a, mo a, a, mo a movement to calculate it differently. The easiest way to understand it is that we are in a declining cost industry where the costs go down and the function goes up, and yet the way the measurement works is that makes it look like things are getting less successful, not more successful. So, you know, Bob Solo said famously, computers are everywhere except in productivity. So why haven't we solved this problem? 
Um, well, the, the economists that I've spoken with say that this is actually an economic measurement error, that they're not measuring things correctly. Um, I think that it's probably best for us to just focus on building incredibly powerful products that make people more productive, and eventually the measurement systems will catch up. I will tell you, I, I wanted to mention that uh, in the context of productivity, uh, ignoring the measurement question for the moment, you have countries like Japan, China, Europe, uh, nation states, and to some degree America, where you have an increase in the dependency ratio. That is, you have more, um, more people not working on a relative basis than people working. So in order to make the math work for the next 30 or 40 years, you have to increase the real productivity of the people who are working in order to pay, for example, for retirement, health care, and all so forth. The only way I see to do that is a very strong use of automation and computerization to make the working people more productive. Right? So I don't know whether we can measure that, but otherwise, how are we going to afford the kind of productivity improvements on a declining percentage of workforce to support an increasing number of older people. And by the way, an increasing number of older people is good, right? People are living longer, it's excellent. Uh, a lot of math says that we have to do this. Okay, thank yes, you. Bill. I'm uh, Bill Drake, University of Zurich. There was some discussion years ago about whether Google had a foreign policy. And Google was quite <coughs> involved in a number of important areas during the Obama administration. <coughs> Internet freedom, for example, the push to get digital trade issues onto the agenda, um, and also the effort to try to get the State Department a little bit more up to speed with using technology and being in the modern work world and implementing new ways of doing things. Then we had an election. Uh, you may have heard about this. And uh, since then, I'm not quite sure what your plans are. Do you still see yourself moving forward with those kinds of issues? Uh, freedom, digital trade, moving to foreign policy mechanisms in a more uh, directed uh, information age way, given this current administration, or if not, we will be doing things on your own? How does the change switch? So let me just restate for our, our uh, folks watching online the question, which they couldn't here, which is, does Google have a foreign policy around uh, international trade in, in the current environment, and what would that be? So, so your, your question listed some of the things that we did under Obama, and we're absolutely continuing those in the current administration. One of the issues in the current administration is many of the positions that we would be naturally dealing with are not yet filled or in some confirmation process. But I don't expect any change. In, you know, the, the basic messages of Google, which are that you're better off with more information, more free trade, a more digital world, digital education, STEM education, H1B um, openness, uh, diversity, et cetera, et cetera. They're not going to change. Thank you. Technology tax. So um, there's a set of people, the question had to do with the universal basic income. Uh, there's a lot of people who are debating whether this is a reasonable response to the potential changes in the workforce or the current ones. I think it's an excellent debate. Um, what I would like to see with the universal basic income is I'd like to see a country adopt it and, and, and actually run the experiment and see if you get a better outcome. And there are a number of countries that are in the process of doing this. So rather than just announcing we're going to take the United States, which is an incredibly complicated place, and change our, our tax policy in such a, a tremendous way, a tremendous instead of a maximum amount of change, not necessarily endorsing it, um, why don't we see what happens in a number of other, uh, shall we say, more limited domains uh, with respect to the question of inequality? One thing I do want to say is I am concerned that if I go forward 10 or 20 years, that inequality increases, even though I'm very optimistic about the power of jobs, uh, jobs and information and access. And the reason I'm concerned about that, and something we should be debating a lot, is that uh, globalization produces uh, essentially globalized outcomes, right? And so if you have a knowledge economy, which is what we are in, the knowledge economy produces the people who have the most knowledge and so forth can get a, a differential benefit, especially if they can sort of run globally. And this is, again, not a new observation. 
So I worry about, I don't worry about the jobs issue, I don't worry about the, in aggregate, I don't worry about the economic growth argument if we don't screw it up. But I do worry, if you look at, in the last decade, inequality has increased uh, around the world, and it's been studied pretty thoroughly, and many important functions and so forth have not seen wage increases. So from their perspective, things are, are getting worse, not better. Universal basic income is one of a set of tools, but there are a number of other proposals. The most, the, the most interesting one that I heard was actually the following, um, that you would try to figure out the winners and you would figure out a way to tax them to create trust for the children of the next generation who could then be educated and learn to play in that. So that's a true intergenerational tax. But there, there are many such ideas and I think they should all be tested. Thank you. I, I, don't have a, I don't have a strong opinion on any particular tax. I'm just saying that I think we should try a couple different variants in different countries and see which one produces the best aggregate outcome. Thank you. Last question. Hi, I'm Vanessa. I'm also, I'm Vanessa. I'm also an application developer, so I really like technology. Good. I, I think in, uh, internet actually brings different thoughts together and brings the world together. But nowadays, with the artificial intelligence and machine learning, basically the news we're reading, it keeps posting the news that we're interested in. That's basically uh, similar to how our mind thinks. Do you think that actually um, introduce more fragmentations? making the word more the, the question had to do with the filter bubble and whether apps are essentially presenting information that just we want to see. A lot of people have been concerned about this for a long time. And I, my first answer is I think the companies that are involved in this have a moral responsibility, if not a business responsibility, to show at least diversity of opinion, right? At least alternative points of view. Um, and if you show it and, this, and the audience doesn't want to read it, well, that's probably the best that we can do. But there are lots of ways of doing the scenario, various forms of associative matching and other technologies that can service, sur surface very interesting alternative points of view. The technology allows this. It's a question for the companies and the tools to, to implement it. Thank you very much. I want to thank you for being with us. Oh, You've been you. hugely generous. And it's been a real thank you very pleasure. much. Thank you very much.